I'm going to talk about computer-assisted text analysis, and I'll explain the archaeological bit. Um, keyword analysis is type of text analysis, and um, certainly I'm dealing with a large corpus of qualitative data, a large amount of it, um, and one of the major attractions of using a computer to um, analyse text is that you can deal with much larger amounts than by manual methods of actually reading it and coding it and retrieving coded chunks. Um, so um, the archaeology bit probably comes from the fact that when I first started out in this, I used to start my talks, and so I've revived these quite amusing pictures to start this talk with. This is a picture of a horse, as you can see, and it's the way people used to think horses ran. Um, and uh, when slow motion photography came in, they realized that horses ran in a very different way. So I, I used to show these two pictures in order to really give this sense of amazement that I felt when I discovered this method and could suddenly see things, which I couldn't see by what I still call manual method, which is basically the old way of dealing with text, which is to read it. Okay? I didn't have to read the text, but I had a different technology for looking at text that revealed things about the text which seemed to me to be true, but which I hadn't noticed before. And another thing which I used to show people, and I'm showing to you now, are these aerial pictures. And that's where the archaeology comes in, because this is aerial archaeology, apparently in conditions of drought. If you go up in a sort of helicopter or a drone or something and take pictures of certain areas, you can see the outlines of old structures. This is an old building in um, fields, and this actually is a, an aerial archaeology picture. It's a little bit blurred, I'm afraid, um, showing Offa's dyke um, running down through a field, which, um, and, and, and these features often can't be seen but from ground level. A feature like that, if you stood in that field, you wouldn't be able to see this feature. And that seems to me to be what computer-assisted analysis of text um, did for me. It, it allowed me to see things that I couldn't see using old methods. Um, okay, well, I, d I don't know if any of you have attended my talks on this subject before, but if you have, you'll have seen me going through an initial example, which I'm going to go through fairly quickly um, without getting into a lot of detail, um, just to show you the basic principles of um, analysing words using a computer. Okay, And for this, I'm going to introduce you to a study where I used a bit of software called Wordsmith Tools. Okay? Wordsmith Tools is one of a family of softwares, very different from um, the kind of thing like NVivo or uh, MaxQDA, which people you know, think of as tools for analyzing qualitative data. Um, things like Wordsmith Tools and other, other similar programs are basically were developed for the discipline of linguistics to look at patterns of words. Um, you count the number of three letter words or four letter words. Why you would want to do that, I have no idea, but all sorts of things like that. But more interesting things are which words go together, collocations, co-locations, uh, looking at how words change their meaning according to what words they're associated with. These things interest linguists, and of course they interest social scientists as well. So Wordsmith Tools is a good way of looking at how words behave. So the material that I was dealing with on this first ever project that I began using this software on, um, if you Google Wordsmith Tools, you can go to the website and it costs 60 quid to download. Um, there is actually a free similar thing called AntConc, A-N-T-C-O-N-C, which again, if you Google it, it's on the website of a man who works in Japan who invented this thing. It's an American guy, I think. And AntConc does most of the things that Wordsmith Tools does, but it does it for free. Okay? It's not quite as nice an interface, but um, if you want to experiment with it, you can do this fairly cheaply. Anyway, I had a situation where I had an awful lot of material to analyse. I had nearly 1.4 million words downloaded from a breast cancer forum where people were talking about their experiences of breast cancer. And I had about 300,000 words where people were talking about prostate cancer, okay? So I wasn't going to read all this stuff. So I ran it through a computer, Wordsmith tools on the computer. And I discovered that the word PSA, 
which it stands for prostate-specific ant antigen. When men type in their stories of you know, what my prostate cancer experience is like, they will often use the word PSA because they've been for a PSA test. In fact, in that body of um, 267,000 or so words, um, the word PSA occurred 1,164 times. Okay. Um, which was 0.42% of all the words in the um, prostate cancer text. It only occurred once in the breast cancer text. RC stands for reference corpus. In this case, what I'm doing is comparing the prostate cancer text with the breast cancer text and discovering that PSA is the word that has the most keenness, that is the most common in the prostate cancer text compared to the breast cancer text. Very simple thing to do, the sort of thing computers can do in microseconds, okay? And this is basically, I mean, forget about all the numbers. This is basically a list of words which occur lots and lots in the prostate cancer text but don't occur much at all, or if at all, in the breast cancer text. So you've got things like radical prostatectomy, because obviously when people are typing messages, they're not going to type all that in, so they just call it RP. Um, PCA is prostate cancer, RT is radiotherapy. Um, some quite technical things, the Gleason test, um, brachytherapy, these are treatments and so on. But if you look at the words that I've marked in colours, regards is a greetings word, so I've made that blue, and men and urologist and dad are people words, okay? So then we turn the thing upside down and look at what's common in the breast cancer text compared with the prostate cancer text. And if you look at the coloured words, I mean, obviously, words like chemo and breast are um, much more common in the breast cancer text than in the prostate cancer text. But if you look at the people words, it's I, she, her, I'm, women, me, mum, they. And if you look at the greetings words, it's love and X, which an inspection showed were kisses at the ends of messages, OK? So um, you get a far greater range of people words in the popular words in the breast cancer text than in the, in the prostate cancer text, um, and uh, a greater range of greetings words. Now, that's, that's a very simple, very quick thing you can do in about 10 seconds with wordsmith tools, and it, you know, it's pretty obvious. We all know about gender differences in language use, um, very well documented. It's not exactly the sort of finding you would publish, you would think, um, because everyone knows it already. Um, now, one of the things you need to do in um, doing this kind of work is to ensure that the, mean, the words you're interested in have reasonably consistent meanings. In other words, you have to disambiguate words with several meanings. A word like X, for example, could mean X-ray. Why do I say it means kisses? Okay? It's because I've been able to look at it in context. This is a word, scan, which could mean several things. You could scan the horizon, you could climb up a hill and scan the horizon, or you could operate some machine in a medical setting and um, call it a scan, different kind of scan from scanning the horizon. Okay? Um, so if I'm going to call scan a medical word, I need to make sure that people aren't using it in the corpus that I'm interested in as a word referring to scan the horizon. Okay? And you do that by looking at the word in context. And in fact, the computer will generate um, every example of the word with a fixed number of words either side so that you can run your eye down it and realize that X means kisses and scan means medical procedure. Uh, if it had meant sometimes X-ray and sometimes kisses, I would have had a problem. I might not include that word in my analysis. Because on the whole, it's easier to just exclude words with multiple meanings and to just include words with singular meanings. Um, and in fact, Wordsmith Tools produces common three-word clusters in order to investigate the meaning of individual words. Um, and once one has disambiguated words and chosen ones where you're firm about what they mean, it's possible to make a list of the most popular keywords, either in, in this case, the breast cancer text or the prostate cancer text. So a word like... Um, Mm. PSA, if you remember, that was a prostate cancer keyword, whereas chemo was a breast cancer keyword. So th this, I mean, if you remember, I had something like 1.5, 1 1.6 million words. 
I've now reduced the size of my task to a group of words which is big enough to fit on a single overhead projector. Uh, sorry, a uh, PowerPoint slide. <laughs> Dear me. <laughs> yeah, a, a single slide. OK. And, and this is simply in alphabetical order. So this is what I'm going to analyze. I have a much smaller task. And it's, it's very quick to get to this point. I mean, you're usually at this point by about lunchtime if you've begun your analysis at about 8 or 9 in the morning. You've had to look at a few words to disambiguate them. You'd have to prepare the material and put it into the computer. But basically, it's very quick to get to this point. So then, the next step is to categorize these words, which is a very similar procedure to inventing um, coding categories for qualitative data analysis. You, know, like you might want to put all the chunks of text that belong to the concept pain together, or all the con chunks of text that belong to the concept happy together. Well, I want to put all of the individual words that belong to a particular concept. So I might have a concept like sports, and I'll put golf in it. I might have a concept like medical tests, and I'll put Gleason in it, which is the Gleason score that people have when they have prostate cancer. So that's somewhat interpretative. So far, I've just done what the computer told me. But now I'm beginning to interpret. I'm beginning to impose my own vision on the data, as happens in every research project. In every research project, the researcher has to have their own category system for seeing the world. And that's why some people say that no research is ever objective. Um, but these are, these, categories, these are the category systems that I have invented and chosen to categorize keywords in this um, particular um, study, in this particular corpus. And I've decided that body parts are things like breast, arm, chest, head, brain, bone, skin, prostate, bladder, gland, urethra. Okay, and I'm going to call those body parts. And people words are her, she, I, my wife, partner, etc., like that. So you can see it's a, it's a fairly simple thing to do. I, I've categorized words into uh, groups. I could have categorized them into verbs and pronouns. So, I mean, there's all sorts of different category systems depending on your research project. This was a very simple research project that was simply going to look for gender differences. Because once I'd done that, it was possible to see that the support words, all of the support words, were contained, the support keywords, I mean, Men also used words like help, supportive, support, and helped, but they didn't use them very often compared to the people in the breast cancer corpus. So in the breast cancer corpus, those kinds of words were, were, were much more common than in the prostate cancer text. In the breast cancer corpus, there was a huge range of words describing a range of feelings whereas the two words that were more common in the prostate cancer text were quite kind of inhibited um, male-type words, being very concerned about um, this problem I've got. Um, embarrassing. Um, so it was slightly different kind of feelings than, um, it's really scary, um, I was, felt so angry, and, or I'm coping. Okay? Um, and in the prostate cancer text, a much more restricted range of um, um, people words, very major focus on wife, in fact. That was a very strong key word. Um, and a much greater range of people. So the breast cancer experience, once it's talked about, appears to be a much, much more sort of people-oriented experience. Um, and, you know, I won't go into a lot of detail, because with, with the software, and I'm not showing you a live demo of it, you can actually leap to the chunks of text that have these words in them and get good quotes that illustrate how the words are being used and turning into a more accessible qualitative report which puts the reader into contact with the people being quoted. It's not just a, a kind of reporting system which just produces rows of numbers which is a bit alienating for the reader. Um, I've had to kind of quickly show this to you in order to demonstrate the technique. But basically um, the first thing that I ever published using this method was basically about the method, but also told you something about gender differences, which wasn't exactly news, but I think the method was interesting enough to get it published. But then I thought, well, you're not going to choose more interesting comparison groups. So I then looked at men who were on the breast cancer forum and women who were on the prostate cancer forum and tried to look at how people's language and the topics they got interested in 
changed when they actually went into the space, as it were, that, as it were, belonged to the other gender. And so gender accommodation was about that. Again, I'm not going to get into the detail of this, but uh, one of the things about using wordsmith tools is choosing interesting comparison groups. Comparing men and women is a bit boring. Comparing men in a strange place and women in a strange place is a slightly more interesting. The work then spread to, oh, well, this is a little summary of what I concluded towards the middle of my career with computer-assisted text analysis. I concluded that it provided an aerial view that features could be detected that couldn't be seen from ground level. Uh, I like the reliability of the method because inference is more delayed than in conventional qualitative analysis. Often when you read and code in the conventional way, you're thinking all the time about what everything means. That, that process of thinking is delayed. You're, you're kind of forced to confront the data in a way that perhaps conventional reading allows you to evade. And I liked that. I thought it was quite a creative method. Um, the big attraction was that I could deal with much larger data sets than I could in the conventional, smaller, kind of 20 interviews type of qualitative study that I'd been involved with in the past. It tended to emphasize difference at the expense of similarity. And as I say, you've got to choose interesting comparison groups. So after that, um, I managed to get a grant from the SRC and we purchased access to Health, Health Talk Online transcripts. Health Talk Online is a website which um, features the experience of illness and is based on extensive qualitative interviews. Um, and over the years, they've built up probably by now about 2,000 very lengthy interview transcripts of people describing their illness experience across a range of illnesses. And at the time when we did these studies of their collection, we purchased access to just over a thousand interviews. And we were able to formulate comparison groups with very large quantities of text so that we could look at all kinds of subcategory comparison groups. So I was able to look at, I mean, most of the gender literature is about gender differences. Um, but actually, if you look at gender differences across different social class groups or across different age groups, there are actually some quite subtle differences, which you can only explore if you've got enough interviews with enough older people or enough higher social position people or enough lower social position people um, uh, to do those comparisons. So the, the availability of this very large data set meant that we could do comparisons that had never been done in the literature before and resulted in interesting findings. Um, this was a study of people who were interviewed together versus people to who, were, who were interviewed on their own. Uh, again, you'll get these references if you're interested in them, but they're all examples of the application of wordsmith tools. This was a study of interviews versus online for forums on the same topic um, across two different topics, looking at, it was a more, much more methodological thing. And uh, Jonathan and I produced a book on gender and the language of illness eventually from this work. I then got into newspaper reports, doing studies of sleep, eating disorders, and cervical cancer in the mass media. In this case, with um, a couple of students, Emily and Lucinda from Barts and the London Medical School, where I was working at the time. And then I got interested in actually using journal abstracts and um, the titles of journal articles to map an intellectual field. I'd become the editor of this journal, Sociology of Health and Illness, and I wanted to place British medical sociology in the context of world sociology and compare it with American sociology. So it was possible to download millions of words of abstracts that appeared over the, over the years in lots of different journals and look at the characteristics of British medical sociology compared to other types of um, uh, sociology. And down at the bottom there, is a methodological piece which explains how to do keyword analysis using wordsmith tools, okay? So then, you know, I kind of, yeah. So at a certain point in this journey, I'd met this guy in a conference called uh, Normand Pelladeau, who'd invented a bit of software called Wordstat. Um, and he'd shown it to me and I bought it and for five years, I couldn't figure out how to use it because he was French-Canadian and I couldn't understand the manual and I'm not very good with computers. 
But then he came to London and did a workshop. And he's a brilliant guy, and his English had improved as well by that time. And I learned how to use it, and boy, was it exciting, um, because I could, all, I could do so many more things than I could do with wordsmith tools. So I want to just show you a word stat project. I've actually only used this on one published study, because I recently stopped work, because I got into other things. Um, but I think if I was... If I had 10 or 20 years of research life ahead of me, this is the program I'd use, because although it costs a lot more than Wordsmith Tools, uh, it's absolutely brilliant, um, and it does so much more. Okay, so I'll just show this to you through an example. This was a study, um, actually this is interview text, and it's actually not a very huge corpus, okay? It's about 157 transcribed interviews, okay? And they were in Belgium, about a third of them. Another third were in the Netherlands. And another third were in the UK. And they were interviews with doctors and nurses who were looking after people in terminal care settings um, and talking about their use of sedative drugs. Okay? Now, you may know that in Belgium and Holland, um, euthanasia is allowed under certain circumstances. And in the UK, it is not. Sedation is not euthanasia, but sedation can be a variable depth. You can give someone a sedative to just lightly reduce their consciousness if they're very distressed, or you can give them a sedative to completely remove their consciousness. Um, you can give people a sedative and then stop giving it to them so that they wake up again, or you can give them a sedative and they never wake up again. You keep them unconscious until they're dead. Um, and that's a huge ethical issue, okay? Now, in a country where euthanasia, giving of a lethal injection, is allowed under certain circumstances, is the use of sedatives different from a country like the UK, where people are very worried about being accused of giving euthanasia? I don't know if you remember the controversy about the Liverpool Care Pathway a few years ago, which was a protocol which guided doctors and nurses in how to look after terminally ill people which some people accused some doctors and nurses of using too slavishly and um, uh, contributing to the deaths of patients by sticking too rigidly to a, a series of measures which um, would almost inevitably end in the patient's death. Um, in fact, the Liverpool Care Pathway was an incredibly helpful checklist for improving the quality of care. It's a great shame that it's been taken off the shelf now. All that news Daily Mail propaganda about it was a lot of rubbish. But um, sadly, the reputation of the Liverpool Care Pathway sank because um, the people who were supposed to be preserving life were being accused of ending life. And those kinds of fears surround sedation in the UK. Okay? People don't want to be accused of <coughs> overusing sedatives and it becoming like euthanasia. So are British doctors and nurses different from Dutch and Belgian doctors and nurses? Are they talking about the same thing when they use sedation? Those were the sorts of issues that this project um, involved. And in fact, um, that publication um, reports a word stat analysis of the material. And this publication reports a manual code and retrieve using NVivo analysis of the material. And if you're really interested, you can read both of them and see how they differ and the overlaps. Although this, I have to say, would have taken a lot less time to do than this because Jane had to read all of those 157 interviews. Uh, I just read a few to get roughly familiar with them, but I'm very superficial. I don't know. OK, um, so this is one of the interviews showing in, um, uh, well, it's showing in a, a program called QDA Minor. WordStat is actually an add-on to QDA Minor, but don't worry too much about that. So this is actually a conventional bit of quality data analysis software. You've got the text appearing. I could code this text in the same way as I could with NVivo. And this particular one is clearly a nurse who was in the UK. So each of the interviews is tagged with whether it's a doctor or a nurse, whether it's UK, Netherlands, or Belgium, 
um, whether it's hospice or um, hospital or community, one or two other <laughs> variables which each interview um, relates to. Okay, so um, what um, WordStat enables you to do is to make a list of all the words in the document in the same way as WordSmith Tools does. It also allows you to make a list of all the two-word phrases and the three-word phrases and the four-word phrases, however many you want, that occur in all of the documents that you're analysing. And it can list them in descending order of something called the TFIDF score. Um, there's a definition of that score down there, but basically what the TFIDF score is, is uh, to score highly, a word has to be very frequent, but more frequent in some documents than others. So a word like and or the is very frequent, but it's probably roughly equally distributed across all documents. Whereas a word like euthanasia is probably very frequent, but I know for a fact that it's um, clustered in certain documents and not in others. So it makes this list, and if you take the top however many words you want to choose, and two word phrases too, three word phrases, which are often much more sort of solid in their meaning than one words. Um, in this case, so let's say the top 300 words, you have a look at them in context, you do a keyword in context display to see how they're being used, to check that they're being used in the way that you think they might be. Taking the ones with consistently singular meanings, don't bother with the ones which mean several different things at once. Um, and the software allows you to place them into a user-defined dictionary, which is basically categorizing the words and phrases. But as I say, only the words and phrases that are very frequent and more frequent in some documents than others. And once this, these dictionary um, collections have been formulated, which is basically the coding scheme, equivalent to a coding scheme in, say, in Vivo, um, you can look at the distribution of the dictionary groups. You can say, this dictionary group, you know, these, the words and phrases that belong to this dictionary group tend to be used a lot by Dutch doctors but not very often by Belgian nurses. Okay, so you can start to look at you know, where the hotspots are for the use of these dictionary categories. This is a list of the dictionary labels uh, in this project. Um, that one's called choices. So this was words associated with choosing things. So the word choice and choose and choosing, they would have been words belonging to choices, opting, um, maybe some others too. Eating and drinking words, family members words, um, saying goodbye words is highlighted there. Saying farewell, he said goodbye, he said his final farewells, she gathered them together and said goodbye. Um, that's actually an expansion of the saying goodbye um, dictionary category. I'm sorry about the rather sad nature of this, these examples. Um, unfortunately, my research has often delved into these topics, um, uh, and they're quite emotional and sad topics. But um, uh, I hope it's possible to focus on the sort of methodological angle of this. But these, these um, words, uh, final farewell, final goodbye, the star is a wildcard character, so that could be final goodbye and final goodbyes. So it can be plural. Um, essay farewell could be say farewell, says farewell, saying farewell, said farewell. Do you see how that works? It's just a wildcard thing. So these are all actually phrases rather than single words belonging to the dictionary category saying goodbye. Okay? And we have other dictionary categories. Settled and comfortable. Calm, comfortable, peace, relaxing, relief, serene, settled, soothing. <laughs> Okay, so they're all words that belong to that concept and have been looked at in their context to make sure that they are being used in the way that uh, I imagine. So this is a statistical display, but I'll show you some quality material in a minute, which shows that agitation and distress is very common in the UK, but not very common in Belgium or the Netherlands. And that's statistically highly significant. So 9.5% of all the words in the dictionary in the UK that were listed belonged to agitation and distress. That's because UK doctors and nurses like to say sedation is a response to symptoms, symptoms like agitation and distress. Okay? It's not a form of euthanasia, it's a medical treatment which is a response to the distress of our patients. 
Whereas the Belgian and the, and, the, and the Dutch doctors and nurses are not so concerned to do that. They want to make people settled and comfortable in the UK. Um, they're interested in keeping people semi-conscious, not unconscious. They're, they're worried about the dosage that they give. They, they don't want to give too high a dosage. They mentioned the Liverpool Car pathway a few times. Uh, there's a few other things there, but uh, I'll whiz over them. Um, in Belgium and the Netherlands, on the other hand, people feel that the state of, a, of the patient obliges them and makes it necessary to do something, um, to provide palliative sedation, in fact, which is a phrase which isn't used in the UK very much at all. Uh, often it's an it's a, it's a, um, alternative to choosing euthanasia, which is bureaucratically cumbersome, involves filling in forms and waiting for three weeks to make sure that a request for euthanasia is consistent, whereas sedation just can be given straight away. It's very easy to bypass all of the restrictions on euthanasia and simply knock people out in Belgium and the Netherlands. Um, sorry, my feelings got away with me there. Um, <laughs> uh, often it's associated with, with ceasing to give um, people food and uh, nutrition in the Netherlands and, and Belgium. And it's often justified on the grounds that people have chosen it. Pe people choose sedation in Belgium and the Netherlands, sometimes instead of euthanasia. It's seen as an option that they can have. And the Netherlands isn't all that different from that. I think in Belgium it's a little bit more, bit, bit cruder. And in the Netherlands they've been doing all of this for a very long time and they've become more sophisticated. But you can see that there are some differences appearing between the countries. Um, yes, in, in, in one of the interesting ones was there's a lot of words belonging to at this moment. There's a, there was a moment at which the sedation was given, whereas in the UK it was a process. It was gradually titrating the dosage against the symptoms, whereas in Belgium, the moment had come, they said goodbye, and we started the sedation. Okay, so that was it. You know, it's a moment, a point in time where people say goodbye because they're otherwise unable to continue. And they went into deep unconsciousness and stopped fluid. Okay. So the software also allows you to show this in diagrammatic form. That's the UK, number one. That, I think, is Belgium, and that is the Netherlands. And this is the distribution of the dictionary categories in space. So you can see the Liverpool Care Pathway, which is only used by British doctors and nurses, is very near to number one. Agitation and distress, semi-consciousness, proportionality, giving, giving dosage proportionate to the symptoms. These are all characteristic of British dis uh, discussions of sedation. Whereas in um, Belgium, being unable to continue, having a moment, sorry, some of them are covering each other up. You can see that visually, you can see that, that Belgium and the Netherlands have a lot in common and that they're both very different from from the UK. Um, here's some actual examples. I've nearly finished. Um, this is a, I'll just show a Belgian one and a UK one because they're fairly long, these examples. Okay? So Belgian, he was ready to go, he was finished. The, the, um, the bold is uh, a, a word that were included in the dictionary. He was physically finished, able to say goodbye, the children came, everyone came. Able to say goodbye to everyone. Took him a week. He said goodbye to everyone. On the day the sedation started, so that was a moment word, he again said goodbye. He'd had enough, so that's also a, a, a key word, having had enough. Uh, a dictionary word, rather. The doctor gave dormicum, which is their word for midazolam, which is the British word for sedative drug. He fell asleep very quickly. We immediately attached the pump, and he didn't wake up again. Okay, that's, that's a, that, given the keyword analysis, it was possible to pick out typical clusters of words which went together and then zero in on examples which brought out the key difference of um, the way Belgian doctors were operating. In the UK, um, this is a, a typical um, quote, gentlemen who'd been struggling with periods of agitation, staff were trying, there was a lot about staff trying and struggling to help. Uh, the patient felt he wasn't settled, he was still quite distressed, agitated and distressed, terminal agitation, classical when you see it. There weren't any other treatment options. We needed to give him something, relieve his distress. Um, 
The midazolam settled him, relieve agitation, make them more sleepy, sedate him, but to use appropriate levels of medication titrated. Um, you can see that a very, it's a very different approach to sedating someone. And this was much more typical of the um, UK doctors and nurses. Okay. So to conclude then, um, I think both of these programs allow for reliable descriptions of the main themes of very large amounts of text. Compared with manual methods um, for identifying themes, they're much more economical on effort. And they give a picture that, in my opinion, is less biased by the investigator's personal preferences. Um, and they enable interesting comparisons between groups of text to be made. And, uh, I don't see them as being a quantitative method. Um, sometimes in content analysis guidebooks, you see text mining and text analysis described as a quantitative method. For me, when I write these things up, I don't show, or I try not to show people too many big tables of numbers. I try to show them quotes, but to demonstrate that the quotes have been selected on the basis of a quantitative analysis so that the re research reports are accessible and you can relate to them uh, at a sort of emotional and experiential level, um, uh, rather than the rather off-putting um, technical material that sometimes is contained in research reports. So I see it as a quantitative and a qualitative approach, which breaks down this uh, divide between the two. Okay, I think that's uh, probably it.